Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Church Online. We're so grateful that you're joining us this morning. We're grateful to be coming into your homes again. Uh, I guess this is about the eighth week that we've done this now, and we're so grateful that you're joining us each week. You know, one question I get uh, very frequently, especially now, is when are we going to open the church again? And to that, I always want to respond to people, well, the church is not closed. I know what they mean, but the church has not been closed because the church is you and me. It's the body of Christ. And and frankly, during this time, the body of Christ has risen up and so much has happened around the world through the body of Christ, especially you. I just want to take a minute and say, I'm so proud of you, New Covenant. Many of you have been continuing to be so faithful in your generosity and giving and in helping. Because of you, we've been able to help many, many families who have been Uh, hit by this crisis financially or needing of food. And many of you have served in the food pantry as well. So I just want to take a minute and say thank you to you. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. When are we going to get back together in our buildings to worship again together? And so to that, I want to give you a short update. And part of that is, is we've been praying about this. We've been planning this. And we have some plans in place. But we are going to wait until tomorrow, May 18th, when the governor, Governor Abbott, is going to give an address. And when he gives that update... Uh, to let us know a little bit about how the economy can continue to open up. Uh, We'll give you an update after that. So be looking tomorrow night or Tuesday morning. I'm not sure which one I'll give, but I will give an update either on our social media page or on our website. So be checking then. Uh, We're excited to get back together with you. We miss you. We love you. And we're praying for you every week. Uh, But we want to get back together at the right time where we can worship the way that we're accustomed to worshiping together and also provide an environment uh, that's safe for you. So Be looking for that tomorrow. We're in a series called All Things New, though, and this is the fourth week of this series, and then we've been talking about how out of this season, how God wants to do some new things and maybe do some things differently or maybe refocus some things, and in week one, we talked about how he wants to set a new pace and how we can't go back to this uh, too fast pace, and I was tempted to say too furious, but I'm not going to say it, too fast you know, or or running around crazy and and our schedule so full. And God wants us to come out of this walking at the pace of grace that he created us to walk in. And then we talked about a new purity and how uh, during this time of being tested by fire and uh, God wants us to come out of this, you know, refined by his fire and purified for his purposes. And then last week I had the joy and the privilege of having my beautiful wife, uh, Tandra Warnock, and our wonderful women's director, Sarah Greer, join me for a Mother's Day message where we talked about a new perspective or new perspectives that should come out of this. So if you missed any of those, I wanna encourage you, go back and you can give them a watch or a listen so you can catch up. But we're gonna continue today and I don't wanna necessarily talk to you about something new. I wanna talk about renewed focus on purpose, a renewed purpose. You know, God's purpose and plan for our life has really always been the same, but if we're honest, we can get distracted very easily by the things going on around us, just by life, especially now during the time that we're in. Many of us have been distracted. Our whole world's kind of stopped, if you will. And I want us to come out of this with a renewed focus on God's plan and God's purpose for our lives. In fact, that's what Paul says in Ephesians 5, that we've got to pay attention to how we live. Ephesians 5, 15, he says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. I pray that we make the most of every opportunity coming out of this. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. That's what I want us to do. I want us to understand what God's plan and what God's purpose is for our life. And, And our purpose as a church is to help you walk in God's purpose for your life. That that's been our plan and that's been our purpose. And so my my prayer, I feel like, is very similar to Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, when he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may he give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And that's my prayer for you, that you get the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Look at this. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that the eyes of your heart would be open. So often we, we get caught looking just with our physical eyes. That's what gets us distracted is we're looking at everything around us with our physical eyes. But Paul's praying here, no, I want the eyes of your heart to be open, your spiritual eyes to be open. Why? Look, so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in or with his holy people. What he's saying is, is I want your spiritual eyes to be open so you can know your spiritual purpose. You've got to know what God has called you to do because that is where you'll find hope. In other words, your hope is tied to purpose. 
And there's too many people who are walking around today with no hope, with no sense of purpose, with no sense of direction for their life. They're just going through the motions. They're just existing, but they're not really living. And so I want us to emerge from this refocused on God's plan and God's purpose for our life. It's, it's a part of our mission as a church. And so I want to give you what those are. And his first purpose and plan for your life is that you would know Jesus, that you would truly know him. That's what Paul was praying in Ephesians 1.17, that you would know him better, that you would know him more. That, that word know is the same word that Jesus would use in John 17.3 when he said, and this is eternal life. This is real life. This is abundant life, that they would know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent, to really know him. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. Nobody gets to the Father except through him. In fact, he died on the cross so that you could have a real relationship with him. He made way for us to have a relationship with him, and that's what he's talking about here, that you would know him in an intimate, relational way. In fact, that word know is the same word used in Ephesians 1.17 and in many places in the scripture. In the original language, in the Greek, that word is gnosko. And that word means to know experientially, to, to know by experience. It's a very intimate word, actually. It's the same word that's used when talking about a marriage, a relationship between a husband and a wife, that when they know each other intimately, that's how intimate of a relationship Jesus wants to have with you. And, and marriage is always the picture of our relationship with Jesus. And that same word, no, by the way, this is where the heavy comes in a little bit. That same word, no, by the way, is the word that Jesus used when he said, people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these miracles in your name? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never gnosko you. I never had that intimate relationship with you. These are people who knew about Jesus who maybe even used his name for something, but he's saying, no, it's not about just knowing about me or using my name for something. No, I wanna have a real intimate relationship with you. And that is God's purpose and plan for your life. You know, in my, in my own marriage, the day I got married, my relationship started. That's when I really truly began to have a relationship with my wife. And, and that's when I began this journey of knowing her more intimately. And it's the same with our relationship with Jesus. The day that we invite him into our heart, it begins this journey of knowing him more. And the more that I know him, the more I wanna know him, the more I realize there's so much more to know about him. And here's a great tip for couples who are married or also in your relationship with Jesus. Never stop discovering more about your partner or more about Jesus. They're, make it your lifelong journey to continue to know them more deeply and more intimately. And that's God's purpose and plan for your life. That's his number one purpose and plan for you is that you would know him. Not about a set of rules or religion, but an intimate relationship. And you can have that today if you don't have that. But after you give your, your life to Jesus and you, you begin to grow, just like our natural lives, you know, we're, we're born as a baby and then we, we grow. This is what happens in our spiritual lives. His second plan and his purpose for your life is that you'd begin to grow in him. And part of growing in him is growing out of who you used to be and into who he created you to be. It's this journey of this growing in him. And I love this beautiful picture in Ephesians chapter 4, 15 and 16. He says, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. That's the transformation that happens, that we begin to grow more and more into the image of Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Now look at this. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I love that. Each part is important because it helps the other parts grow. This is why we are a church of groups. This is why we, we stress so much that you need to be in relationships. I'm even wearing the shirt today. We're better together. I truly believe that because you cannot grow without people around you. That's what this scripture says. The body helps each other grow. And, and you can't grow in Christ unless you have people around you who are helping you grow. But in order to grow, you have to be healthy, right? Healthy things grow. So what in your life is unhealthy, right? When we come to Jesus, all of us come at the same place where we come to Jesus and we're coming from a past life and we're entering into a new life as a new creation in him. But we have some things from our past, maybe an addiction issue, a sin issue, maybe some hurts or some wounds, wounds or some, some filters over our eyes of ways that we've seen things that are unhealthy that we've got to get rid of 
in order to continue to grow. And that comes when we get into relationship with people. You know, the Bible says that we go to God for forgiveness. He forgives us of our sins and cleanses us, but we go to people, his people, for healing. Look at James 5, 16. It says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power when it's working. It's only when you begin to open up to somebody. It's only when you begin to confess to God's people what's really going on in your life and they begin to pray with you that you find healing. And this is part of God's wonderful plan for your life. But if I'm going to be honest, that won't happen until you get to the place that you can begin to take off the mask of pretending to be somebody to say, here's who I really am. Here's what I'm really going through. Here's something I didn't want anybody to know. And we're so afraid to do that, aren't we? We're afraid to really get honest with people and tell them what's really going on because we're afraid they're going to be like, I can't believe you dealt with that or I can't believe you're going through that. And the reality is, is what you'll find is when you, when you open up and say, here's something that I've gone through or I am going through, they're going to be like, you too, right? I, I've gone through that too. I thought I was the only one. And that's the enemy's plan is to get you to think that you're the only one so you'll keep things in the dark. But whatever you keep in the dark has power over you. Whatever you keep concealed will control you. It keeps you bound to that issue. But when you open up about it, you can find freedom. Whatever you hide will keep you sick. You're only as sick as your secrets. But what God's desire and his plan for you is, is that you get with godly people and open up so that you can find healing and continue that part of growing in him that he wants for your life. But sin is weighty. It weighs us down. You know, the picture I had this week when I was praying about this is, is a plant, a flower. A flower can't grow if I put a big rock on it, right? No, the weight of the rock will kill the flower. It's the same with sin. The weight of sin will ultimately kill you until you lift that rock up and you get that weight off of you. Can, you can't really grow the way God designed you to grow. But the reason this is so important is because if you don't believe that God's plan is for you to grow, then you'll resist relationships that help you grow. You'll resist relationships with God's people who will challenge you or encourage you or, or, or bring up something in your life that says, hey, maybe we can help you grow in this area. You'll push, you'll push against those. And that's really the opposite of a disciple because a disciple, by definition, is a learner. A follower of Jesus is one who wants to continue to learn and grow into the image of Christ. But that comes in relationships. And it's, it's the truth, this is the truth, that you can grow old and never really grow up. We can hit a point in our life where we can continue to age, but we never really mature. You know, when I said that, you probably thought about somebody from high school that you know that at some high school reunion 40 years later, you, you meet up with them and they're still living like they're in high school. I mean, they look older, like they're grown, but they've never moved past high school, right? I, I think about as cheesy of an analogy as this is, Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite, right? Uncle Rico was a 40-year-old man who, who thought he could still win the starting job of a high school football team. He's like, I had no doubt in my mind we would have won the state championship, right? And you, when you see that in the natural, you're like, something's wrong with that. Like, that guy should be growing up. Just like if you ran into somebody who's a full-grown man with a beard and he's drinking from a baby bottle. We'd be like, that's not right. Like, that's wrong. Like, something's weird about that, right? We know that in the natural, but this is what can happen to us spiritually. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 5.12. He says, you've been believers so long now, you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. Now, this is strong. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. He, he's saying, listen, you can be a believer for a while, but never grow past a certain point. You should be maturing. There's an expectation as a follower of Jesus that we're supposed to grow. But in, in, instead, we're still, we're still acting like we need bottles to drink milk because we won't let people in our life to help us grow, to, to continue to move on. Now, when he said here, you've been believers so long that now you ought to be teaching others, I, I want to make it clear. He's not saying that everybody should have the gift of teaching and you should get up on a platform like this and teach. That's not necessarily what he's saying. But what he is saying is, is you should be growing to the point that you can help somebody else go through something you've gone through, right? That, that's how each part comes together, like Ephesians said, to help each other grow. And that's the beautiful picture of the church. The church should be healthy and growing and full of love, like we read in Ephesians 4. But the church can't be healthy and growing and full of love until we individually are healthy and growing and full of love. And, and that comes in relationships. Growth happens best in the context of relationships. I know in my own personal life, 
that, that my growth has happened best when, I, when I've had people around me that have encouraged me, that have challenged me at times, you know, that, that have pointed out things in my life that maybe I needed to grow in. But that only comes from being with one another. In fact, there's 56 times in the, in the scriptures where it talks about one another. And we read one of them, pray for one another, encourage one another, build one another up, you know, comfort one another, greet one another. We need the body of Christ to help us grow. So today, maybe, maybe that's a question for you today as we're evaluating this is, where, where did I stop growing? Is there a place maybe I plateaued? Is there an issue in my life that's keeping me from growing? And you may need to say, God, well, how do I need to grow through this? You know, maybe I want to understand the word better. Maybe I want to grow in my time with the Lord in my prayer. Maybe there's a sin issue that I need to get real with somebody about and say, I need some help. That's a great question to ask today. But his, his second plan and his purpose for you is that you begin to grow in him. And then the third one is that you would discover purpose. Now you're like, isn't that what we're talking about, the whole thing? Yes, and I'll get to that in just a second. But I want to say this to you, and, I, and I've said this to you before, and I'm going to say it to you again because I believe it that you were not a mistake, that you were created on purpose for a purpose. You're not an accident. You may have been a surprise to someone, but you're not a surprise to God. You know, he knew you in your mother's womb. He formed you exactly the way that he wanted you. That's why Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship, his craftsmanship, his handiwork. God spent some time on you, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love that because it, it gives us this beautiful picture of, of uh, he spent time on each one of you individually. And this is how you know you're not an accident or a mistake. It's because he created things for you to do before you were even born. And only you could fulfill them. Only you can walk in those things. Only you can walk out those good works. So what we mean here when we say discover purpose, what we really mean is discover how you were made. Discover your gifts. Discover your abilities. Discover your personality and how God wired you so that you can use those to walk out God's purpose for your life. In fact, our purpose is always to fulfill God's purpose. How we do it is differently because we each have different gifts and that's why we need each other. It just so happens that that's a part of our next steps classes. Step three, which is today at 1115 and you can jump in in our Zoom groups, just message us and say, I'd like to join and we'll give you the, the code and the password to join. But in step three, it's all about your ID, how God made you, how God wired you so that you can discover your personality, and your unique gifts so you can walk out those good purposes that God has for you, those good works that he created for you. So join in today. You can just message us and we'll send you information on that. But your gifts and your abilities, though, they're not for you. They're for others. Look at 1 Peter 4.10. As each has received a gift, every single one of you have at least one gift. Everybody I know has multiple gifts, but he's saying each of you at least has one. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. What he's saying here is your gifts are not just so you feel better about yourself. Your gifts aren't just so you can promote yourself or, or get famous one day or make a lot of money. Those things may be a part of God's plan, but that's not the purpose of your gifts. The purpose of your gifts is to serve one another. And I love that he calls, he says that we're stewards of these gifts. A steward is a manager. A steward is one who's been in, put in charge or entrusted with something. So he's saying God has entrusted each of us with gifts, and we're going to have to give an account one day for how we use those gifts to serve other people. The gifts that God has given each one of us are used to advance the kingdom by serving other people. And I love that he calls them gifts of God's varied grace. In other words, every time you serve, you are ministering God's grace to other people. In fact, that's what that word serve means. It's actually another word for the word minister. So you could actually say, use it to minister to one another. All of you are ministers of God's grace through your gifts to other people. And I'm so grateful for all of our serve teams, or, or you could call them ministry teams. We have hundreds of people who minister normally here on the weekends with us, using their gifts to advance the kingdom of God. And I, I'm excited to be able to get back with you and minister and serve with you very soon. But many of you are continuing to do it right now. You continue to serve people. And you probably know this, this reality, and that is that this is where true joy and fulfillment come from. Like you'll never truly be satisfied or you'll never truly find joy in this life until you are using your gifts and your abilities to serve other people. But what, it, what ends up happening is, is that people, when they don't know that purpose, they begin to search for other things that might fulfill that. They begin to search for that in their job or, or in money or in relationships or, or in vacations, all of which aren't necessarily bad things. They're just counterfeits to satisfaction. 
you could put it this way, when we, when we don't see God's purpose for our life, we settle for an earthly counterfeit. When we don't see what God wired us and created us to do, and we're not walking in that, we're gonna be grasping at something else to satisfy us. And the reality is, is we can go to bed with all of those other things every night and say, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had a better job, if I just had a bigger house, if I just had more money, if I could just take more vacations, if I could just, you fill in the blank. We think that would satisfy us, but it won't. It just cre creates this void that we have to keep trying to do something to satisfy. But when you know your purpose, you know how God made you, and you're using those gifts and those abilities to serve one another, you can go to bed at night and say, well, you know, I still got problems, but I can rest well knowing that I'm walking out God's plan and his purpose for my life, that I'm being a good steward of his gifts. So, so that, is, that is the purpose for your life, is that you would use those gifts and abilities to serve and to minister to other people. And ultimately, this is what it leads to and this is the fourth purpose for your life, is that you would change your world. God designed you, he hardwired you, he hardwired every single human and in our hearts to, to want to make a difference, to know that our lives are counting for something, to know that we're making an impact in this world, that we're leaving something behind. That's why you see people who don't even know Jesus, they're doing all, all that they can many times with different charities and organizations trying to leave a lasting impact because that's what we're created to do. We were created to change the world around us. In fact, God put you where you are, when you are, in the timeline of history so that you could reach the people around you. He put you in the home you're in, the city that you're in, the family that you're in, in the neighborhood that you're in, at the job that you're in, in the school that you're in, so that you could reach the people around you. In fact, this is what uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us. It says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're his representation right? We're his representation on this earth that God makes his appeal through us. I love that. As imperfect people, God still chooses to use you and I to reach the people around us. It's a part of his master plan. It's a part of the great commission that he gave us to go and to tell the good news to everybody. We like to say it this way, that you are God's plan A to reach the people around you. This is when you find that satisfaction, is when you are using your gifts and your abilities and you're beginning to use those to serve people and bring people to Jesus. That's what Matthew 5 tells us. It says that we're the light of the world and that we should let our light shine before others so they can see our good works and give glory to God in heaven. That they would see those works that God created beforehand, before we were even born. As we begin to walk those out, people see those and go, I wanna know that Jesus. I've got to know him like you know him. And we become a part of his master plan. And I tell you right now, people are more open to receiving Jesus maybe than before in our lifetime because their whole world's been shaken up. The, the, the thing that they thought was stable is unstable. And they're searching for that. And you have the answers. You know this hope that is found in Jesus Christ. That's a part of his plan for your life. Listen, if you're still alive, our purpose is to reach people for Jesus. If you're still breathing, if you woke up today, God has a purpose and a plan for you. And that's that you would use those gifts and those abilities to reach people. Our lives are short and our purpose is eternal. We have to have an eternal focus. We can't just live for today. We've got to live for eternity. We've got to say, God, I wanna make my life count for something far more than just what I can do with my own abilities. I wanna use the gifts you've given me to reach as many people as possible to make the biggest impact in this earth. And David prayed this prayer in Psalm 39. I think it's a great prayer for us to pray really every day. He says, Lord, Remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. That's, that's not very big. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is just a breath. And it's over. God wants you to make your life count. But you won't be satisfied until you're walking in these purposes of knowing Jesus, having a real relationship with him. And then you begin to grow in him in these healthy relationships with other people. You begin to get real and get rid of the sin in your life and say, God, I wanna grow. I wanna grow in you that I can do my part of, of discovering my gifts and abilities to reach other people ultimately so I can bring them to you. That's how you find joy. That's how you find satisfaction. And that's God's purpose for your life. So I want us to come out of this with, with a renewed focus on that purpose because life is short as you just read here, as, as we know today, it could be here today and gone tomorrow. Let's leave the greatest impact that we can. I'm gonna invite you, if you would, 
bow your heads with me wherever you are and let's just go to the Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask as we begin to pray right now, I ask that you would open the eyes of our heart, God. That you would open our spiritual eyes to see, God, the hope to which we were called. That you have a purpose and a plan for our life, God. And I don't know where everybody is in that journey today. I don't know where you are in any, any one of these steps, but I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd help us to identify maybe where we got stuck or maybe where we need to go to. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you're watching online or listening and you're saying, you know what, I, I've not really been using my gifts and my abilities to, to reach people and that's my start. I need to start serving people. I need to start telling others about Jesus. I need to start using my gifts and abilities to serve Maybe you're, you're saying, you know what, I, I've plateaued. I've gotten stuck somewhere. I'm not really growing anymore. And God's saying, I, want, I need you to get into a group. I need you to jump into a V group online or call some people that you know that are God and say, I need to get real with you. I need to get into a healthy relationship where you can help me grow. But maybe you're also watching today or listening today and you're saying, you know what, I don't have any hope. I don't have any sense of purpose. My life's empty. And I would tell you all, all of that starts by giving your life to Jesus. You can't get to that hope. You can't get to that joy. You can't get to that fulfillment until you ask Jesus into your life, until you surrender your life to him. That's what salvation is. It's saying, God, I don't want to be in control anymore. I've tried. Everything I'm doing is not bringing me hope. Everything I'm doing is not bringing me joy. I'm still lost. When you surrender your life to Jesus and say, I'll do whatever you want, that's when joy comes in. That's when he gives your life purpose and meaning. And I want to give you that opportunity today. If that's you, wherever you are, maybe for the first time you're saying, I'm coming back to Jesus. I've walked away. I was following him and now I have, I have no sense of purpose. You can come back to him today, right now. And I want to lead you in a prayer for that. If that's you, just say this with me. Say, Jesus, I come to you today. I surrender my life to you. I don't want to be in control anymore. Forgive me of my sin. Give my life purpose and meaning. I commit to follow you all the days of my life. Come into my heart today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, if you made that decision for Jesus, first of all, I'm so excited for you. I'm celebrating with you. That's the best decision you could ever make. Welcome to the family of God. And as you've been hearing me say today, listen, you were not meant to do life alone. Each part has a gift to help each other grow. You need to get with a body of believers who can help you grow. And so we want to come alongside you and help you. And if you made that decision, you can comment in the comments or you can private message us. Or you can simply text the word yes card, all one word, to the number you see on your screen. And we'll get some information into your hands. We want to help you know what your next steps are and connect you to people who love you and care about you and want to help you grow. So do that today if you would for me. And listen, family, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful that you joined in with us this morning. Can't wait to be back together again with you soon. I want you to know that I am praying for you. I love you so very much. If you need anything, go to our website and let us know. If you have a prayer request, let us know. We want to be praying for you. But until we see each other again, I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week.